what I'm here to talk about. Um, I'm going to, you know, first few days are all about telling stories, entrepreneurial journeys, and I think um, maybe I have a story that I could share with you. And what I've started this presentation on is three things about being different, being scalable, and being great. Um, these are three things that have stuck with me throughout my life, my career, and what I am today. And I think it's really important, whatever you do in life, whatever you want to be in life, and whatever you achieve in life, do it by being different, being scalable, and being great. So let's start with the first one, which is being different. Uh, I'm a different guy. You wouldn't imagine this, but I'm the kind of person who normally likes to take the opposite way of doing something. So for all of you students at the back, normally when, you, when your parents tell you to do something, it's natural that you'll do the absolute opposite. Uh, and I'm that very kind of guy. Uh, I'm the kind of guy that will never take whatever is put in, some, in front of me as face value. Uh, I'm someone who doesn't like to assume anything. I like to validate. And through these kind of processes, um, I feel that I'm different. So, where I'm not different is, like any of you, I have a family. That's my wife. It's my two children. Um, and this is the kind of antics we get up to when I get back home most of the time. Um, just like anyone else, I've, um, I've been in education. I then finished education, went into the world of work. And really, that's where I thought my career was going to be. I thought I was, my ultimate dream was to have the best job, a director of a corporation. That's what I wanted to become. And my career started in IT. Um, so I was working with a computer company. Um, I developed a lot of my own sort of personal skill sets and uh, achievements that I got seconded to Apple for a little while, and I worked with Apple on launching the iMac across Europe. Um, and this is where my difference comes into mind. So th we're talking about 1999 here, okay? And what was coming after 99 was the year 2000. And what did they, for those of you who understand what was happening at year 2000, they were trying to warn everyone that the, the whole world is going to end and computers are going to die. And you know, if you've got a computer, it's going to explode. <laughs> Here's a guy that works with computers. Uh, so I went home and I'm really worried. I was really, really worried. I thought to myself, oh my God, something's going to go wrong here. I'm not going to have a job come January 2nd, 2000. <laughs> and this is about the time where I used to make, earn more money than my mum and dad put together. And I was quite a young guy, very naive, that I decided to leave the job. I left. I left a high paying job, working, seconded to Apple, because I thought on the 2nd of January, computers are going to explode. I am being honest with you. Loco, right? <laughs> Completely loco. So I moved into electronics. I moved into electronics, and I didn't know anything about electronics. About the only thing I knew about electronics is to switch a light on and off, or to plug something in and make it work. But I went to go and work for a signage company. So these, you see them in the airports, those moving message signs. This is about 2000, uh, April 2000, and um, this company used to produce queue systems which allow you to, um, um, to press a button and it calls, uh, it calls for the next pay person. So you may see these in the supermarket or at, the, at certain offices or in a bank where they press a button and it says go to cashier number five or cashier number four or something like this. I joined this company and I'm come like, I don't understand what else, you know, that you, surely you can do more with these signs. And one day I went to go and see my doctor, okay, and I'm sitting in the waiting area waiting for my doctor, reading a magazine, and um, back then the doctors used to come out and see you and then they shout your name. Now you my name is Ketan. Imagine you're sitting in a room full of people and they call you Cretan. <laughs> Magazine goes up, but an idea dawned in my head. 
Could we use these systems to actually call patients forward so people don't get the names mispronounced? Could we work out a system where people who perhaps have audible issues can see a sign that's coming up? So I went back, I spoke to my bosses, and I said, I think I've got an idea and I want to work on this. Over five years, from two, between 2000 and 2005, I developed the patient call and information system, which ended up going into every GP practice across the whole of the UK, taking the company from a quarter of a million pounds trading when I joined them to just under five million of revenue in my own division. And here's a guy who doesn't even know what electronics is all about. Thinking different doesn't mean that you have to know everything about whatever it is that you want to do. It's about being having the, the vision or the ability and the confidence to actually step forward and say, I think I found a problem and I think I have an idea on how we can solve that problem. And like Richard Branson normally says, or others that have said on their quotes, sometimes it's better to just jump off the cliff and then build the plane on the way down. Well, there's a little bit of that element that goes into this. Thinking different means you don't have to be radical, you just got to be smart. Thinking different is not just about creating evolution and revolution, it's about simplicity. Because we compete too much to think different. And because of that competition, we over-engineer our ideas. Whereas if you keep it simple, it gets you where you want to be. Well, fast forward from 2005, I, start, I moved out of electronics and into healthcare, and I worked with medical devices. And in 2009, after taking on a global product management role for a dialysis company, this happened to me. Six-figure salary. My children were happy. Two, three holidays a year. Christmas presents, bikes, takeaways. We were living a life. <laughs> Not anymore. I'm surplus to the requirement. I'm no longer required. You know what was going through my head? What am I going to do now? Where am I going to go? Who am I going to see? How am I going to overcome this? What if my wife leaves me now because I can't buy her any more jewelry or take her away on holiday? All of a sudden, is stop going to the expensive supermarket, start going to the cheaper supermarket. You know? Don't worry if you drop the bread, just turn it over, or let's brutter it again and start over again. <laughs> Let's economize the way we're working. But the problem here was, everyone will come to a point in their life where you're gonna have what we call a drama. And that's a drama, for me it was. It's the bit where you say, poor me, poor me. What am I gonna do? Where am I gonna go? Who's gonna help me? What's gonna happen to my future? It's me, 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 me. making sure they can't keep up with me, basically. So me, 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 okay? That happened to me. I left, I left work that day when I, to, I was, got told that I'm a surplus to requirement, I'm no longer gonna be required. And all I did on the way home is, what am I gonna do? Where am I gonna go? Where am I gonna find another job? Who's gonna offer me something? Because it was the middle of the financial crisis. Everyone was losing their jobs. That means that every job that was available Instead of two or three people going for it, you're talking about two or three hundred people going for it. I'm just now a little dot in a big C. So I got home and the biggest question was, do I say anything to my wife? And no, I didn't. That pride in me said, don't say anything. You can sort this out tomorrow. But I went to bed that night after dinner and I was looking up and it was really dark and I looked up and I thought to myself, I'm still thinking, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? And it was one of those nights, I don't know if you've ever had this, where it's completely dark in your bedroom, but when you open your eyes and you're looking up, you can still see the ceiling. Well, it was one of those nights. In fact, I could even pretend to see a pretend spider going across. You know, that always happens as well. I had all of this going on, but I just kept thinking about me, 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 until the morning, uh, I, by the early morning, I got to the stage where I'd exhausted everything about me and I started to think about what was happening around me. I went to work the next day. The next morning, I went into the office, opened the door to the managing director's office, sat down, right, uh, you know, in front of his desk, and I said, right, 
okay, I'm going to take your redundancy, but only on one condition. And he says, okay, what is that? And I said, you give me a job. And he goes, sorry? And I said, that's right. You can sack me as long as you hire me. You can fire me as long as you hire me. And he goes, he goes Geren, I know this is a hard time. And he goes, I know this is quite tough on you, but what are you saying? I said, oh, no, 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 no. You're listening with the intent to reply rather than to understand. And he goes, well, make me understand then. I said, okay, here is the problem. We're in a recession. You can't afford the resources. So right now, you're removing all of this employment out of your company. Eventually, the market's going to stabilize and you're going to want to grow. But now you don't have the resources. So what do you do? You hire contractors and consultants while you find your next resource or an employee. These people don't understand your business, they don't understand your culture, they don't understand your customers, they don't understand what you want to do. They're just interested in making money. Why don't you give that job to me? And I'm sitting there, and my hands are going <laughs> like this, not because of what he's going to say, he's going to say, I, in my head I'm thinking, my wife's going to kill me now because I've just <laughs> talked myself out of a job. And the guy was just still, silent, looking at me. And all of a sudden, he goes, do you know what? That's a great idea. And I'm like, eh? <laughs> you know that bit where your, your brain still hasn't engaged what's coming out and your mouth is going, wah, wah, wah. that's what happened to me. I was like, whoa, he bought that? <laughs> Amazing! <laughs> He goes, take a week off, take your severance, and come back as a contractor. So I went home. I still had my company car. I still had my phone. It was only six months later, after that contract, when that, uh, I, forgot, uh, I forgot to tell my wife that I'd lost my job. Because the car went, and the phone went, and she got worried. And she goes, what's going on? I said, oh, I lost my job six months ago. And she's like, you're telling me now? I'm like, I forgot, sorry. <laughs> But in sense, what, what happened here was something happened as I walked out of that room. I looked to myself and I said, what have I just done to myself? I've been employed, become unemployed, and become, then moved on to become self-employed. I didn't become an entrepreneur. I became self-employed. I just became responsible for something on the basis of making an earning to live and sustain who I'm going to become. And this is the thing about entrepreneurship. Most people on, figure that entrepreneurship is all about business and entrepreneurship is just about becoming a CEO. In this world, you don't become a CEO. You start employed or unemployed, you become self-employed, then you become a business owner, then you become a CEO. And the whole purpose of entrepreneurship is thinking differently. It's all about being able to bring up an, an alternative way of overcoming the challenge that's in front of you. Now, in its own quirky way, I found self-employment as a solution to unemployment, even though I'd made a few hiccups along the way. Anyway, I became self-employed and I thought, well, hold on, I'm not the only one that lost their job in this, in this recession. So I started to branch out and I asked them questions. I said to some, uh, some other guys in my network, I said, you lost your job, what are you doing? They go, well, we're not really doing much at the moment. We don't want to go to work for a supermarket. We'd rather w wait until things go down. I said, um, have you ever thought about going self-employed? Now, the reason I wanted to do that is because I got so excited after getting that first contract with my former employee, I went and opened my mouth around the industry and I got more contracts than I could actually deliver. So I was either going to fail because I've now bought more than I can chew, or I could be really interested, you know, really uh, entrepreneurial about this and get someone else to do the work. So I found a couple of guys and I said, I tell you what, I've got a contract. Why don't you come and do some work for me and I'll pay you. Six months on, we had a paper value on contracts of over 1.2 million pounds, and we had 300 self-employed professionals working in the network. Another six months on, I sold the company for seven figures. And I don't know what I'm doing. 
It's just that someone made me an offer and I said, okay. <laughs> what I want to tell you here is that thinking differently doesn't mean that you've got to completely re-innovate the way you do things or revolutionize. Sometimes it's small, small steps on the journey to where you want to go. So really, what do I do? I took that leap of faith. I took that jump, but I did it in a very, very specific way. I didn't jump like I could jump off this stage. Because if I did that, I'm sorry, but you're finished. <laughs> and I'll probably injure myself. And this is the whole thing that, you know, books like The Lean Startup talk about and what I talk about through things of, um, uh, you know, of, of a point of, uh, or a journey of 100 miles starts with its first step. It's very much the whole thing of whatever you want to go out and do, identify the destination that you want to be at. Reverse engineer. So now you know what you want to be at. Then you've got to start working back to what, what does it take to get to where you want to be. And then when you've built your plan, you turn it upside down. You say, right, this is where I've got to start from. And it's one step at a time, not a jump, not a leap, not a faith, because you end up fracturing yourself. You'll end up injuring yourself and you'll probably end up removing any confidence that you have in any processes that you could ever have them. That journey is going to pivot you along the way. Had I not gone to the ambassador's residence for that evening, I wouldn't have met Monica. Had Monica not decided to take a little light to me, I wouldn't be on this stage. Life is full of encounters. Some people say it's serendipitous. I don't say that. There's no such thing as luck. You make your own luck. It's the way you think. You're there on purpose. You are here today with me. That symbolizes something for me, whether it's an opportunity for me to engage in work or it's just that I have one opportunity to touch you know, into your lives and give you something back. The point of it is, is we've, we've come together on purpose and that's what happens in life. So I want you to think differently. Don't think things come to other people because it's luck. Because there's a saying that I stand by, that lucky people get opportunities, brave people take opportunities, but it's winners in the face of adversity that make opportunities. And just by you coming here today and thinking differently, you will make opportunities. Don't wait for them to come. You can go out and grab them. So the second thing I want to talk to you about is becoming scalable. What does it mean to be scalable? I think a lot of people believe it's, it's growth, but it's not. It's a multiplier effect. I think one, one of the most important things in life is that you've got to pr produce a model that works, understand why it works, and then start to push that model out in a way of actually multiplying it. So rather than just being in one place at one time doing one thing, you could actually have two or three of these things happening at the same time. So you think about like a franchise or something like that, that tends to have a multiplier effect. That's how you scale, scale your businesses and stuff like that. But, um, so you got this story here of the fact that I had two companies. So the first company was an outsourcing agency. My second company, I know you guys are filming this and you better edit this out before my wife sees it, otherwise she's gonna kill me. But the secret to this was, is my next business is I wanted to travel the world, but I didn't want to take my wife and kids with me. Sorry. <laughs> so I created a company which would allow me to travel but without them. How cool is that? All the boys are right, I'm taking the notes down on this one. So I started a brand marketing agency which went out to look for niche healthcare brands from around the world which I could bring to Europe. Remember, I've got the model of outsourcing, so the whole idea of it is get the client, build a project, outsource it out, I don't have to do any work, I can just keep traveling. And I had some great fun with this product, uh, with this, because I got to go and see different parts of the world, and I got to see different cultures, and I got to see, meet different people, which is what it was all about. If there's anything in life that I can say to you about how you scale yourself up, if you get the opportunity, or make the opportunity, travel, because the more you travel out there, the more you'll learn on how things are done in different places, the more you become more of a global citizen, the more you can actually help affect whatever it is that you want to achieve. So travel, travel the world as much as you can. 
So anyway, coming back to this whole story of the fact that I avoided my wife and kids coming out with me, a couple of projects and, uh, and projects that I got involved with, I took uh, uh, a kinesiology tape, which is a sports therapy tape from Canada, and I introduced it into the European market, helping them do over half a million rolls in the first year. Uh, how many of you are soccer fans? Yeah? Gareth Bale was one of my first clients there, and as a result of this, I brought an energy-based glucose drink to the European market and got Cristiano Ronaldo as the global ambassador. The product's called Soccer Aid. If you want to Google it, you'll find it. It's, uh, I had a great time. I was working with women's makeup. I was working with all sorts of different things, having a great time doing this stuff. But what I'm talking about in terms of scalability here is I didn't focus on scalability of business in terms of revenue. I was talking about scalability of business in my own personal interest. What was I most passionate about and what I was I most angry about? Because in business, to succeed in whatever it is that you want to do, you can no longer just be passionate. You have to be angry. You have to be angry. Passion gets you up and gets you to work every day. Anger drives you forward. How many of you go to the gym, work out? I do that all the time. No, I don't. <laughs> so when you're doing weights, right? You go, do you do weights? Yeah? So you, you don't do weights and go, oh, I'm tired and put it down. <laughs> I hope you don't, but you see, you're supposed to be pressing. You get to a stage where when you're building, you want to push beyond that pain barrier. And that's where anger comes in. This is why professional weightlifters use a product called creatine because it creates aggression. Where is the creatine in your business? Because that's the bit that's driving you forward. Passion will only keep you alive. It will only keep you going back into work. It's the anger that drives you through. And do you know what? For the brand management company, when I set that up, it was all about giving the little guy a chance. Six months, was, uh, well, uh, over, just over a year after setting up that business, I, I had a client come through called FitPro. They had a magazine. We were doing a project. Uh, um, they, I started to give them some examples of how I'd been collecting data. They looked at the data. They were interested. They made me an offer, so I sold all my data and left that business. And this is roughly around 2011. 2011, then uh, I thought, right, I sold two businesses. I don't really have to work if I don't want to, I'm going to do something else. And I think this happened at the same time. Now, this is footage and clippings of a riot that took place in London and across the UK in 2011, in the summer. This is young people breaking windows, looting and fighting with uh, cops. They were burning cars. And in fact, uh, other young people are dying trying to protect their family businesses. I was watching this from TV, uh, on TV from home, and I said to myself, this, this is a problem. This is a really big problem, and someone's got to do something about it. How many times have any of you come up with something, you know, where you, where you watch something, you see something, and you say, oh, someone should do something about that? Anyone ever done that before? Well, let me tell you, for everyone that just said yes, you are all someone. So stop saying someone can do something about it because you could do something about it. You know, and for me, I thought, what can I do? Now, I drive on the whole perspective of perception drives your behavior, drives your uh, attitude, drives your actions. So whatever it is that you perceive, the way you see it, you produce a behavior towards this. And when I saw this, most people will look at this and say, damn you young people, look at the misery that you're causing and the pain that you're causing. I looked at it as young people crying out for help. If we look at the statistics back in 2011, there were a million young unemployed people in, in the UK. You know, the, the, the country was going through an economic recession with no recovery. Job prospects were really bad. And here you've got this going on. This, is the, this was the boiling point where they just broke out and they were hitting out. And I thought to myself, this is just young people lashing out with the fear and the anger that they've got nothing for their futures. So I got out a nice big piece of paper and a pen and I started to put some stuff together. And overnight, I came up with an idea for an event. I've never done an event before in my life. And here I am with an event. I've got an idea for it. Let's get industry and sectors together. Let's get young people together and we're gonna 
we're going to see what happens. So, because I don't know how to do an event, I was ringing event companies. Every event company puts the, the um, phone down on me because I was talking about young people. So I said, okay, maybe it's not the events. Let's go for some corporations, some big corporations. Maybe they can give us some social money. Every corporation puts the phone down on me. And I'm like, this is, this is not wrong. You know, this is, sorry, this is not right. You know, something, something's got to give here. Something's got to break. Most people with a bit of a novel idea, they've given it a shot. No one's responding. What would you do? Ah, it's not my concern. Remember, I think differently. I said, why? Why are people putting the phone down on me? Do you know what it did? It actually pushed me to, to prove a point even more. I thought I need to appeal to a higher source that day. And unfortunately, God wasn't available. So I said, I'll get the prime minister involved. It's not like I can pick up the phone and say, all right, Dave, can you, uh, can you sort out some, from, some stuff for me? Have you ever heard the saying, six degrees of separation? Not 50 shades of gray, ladies, no, not that book. <laughs> We're not talking about that book today. That's not the wrong talk. That's last Tuesday, not first Tuesday, okay? <laughs> Um, 50, 50, six degrees of separation, <laughs> losing my flow. Six degrees of separation. You're only six degrees away from whoever you want to be connected to. But let me tell you something, guys. You better prepare yourself if you want to get connected and be connected to the person of your choice, because it can happen quite quickly. And if you're ill prepared, you lose that opportunity. So looking through my network, actually, I was three degrees away from the prime minister. I went and met a, a person from a charity who uh, one of my co-founders for another company knew, and I impassed my vision. I said to them, this is what I believe in, this is what I want to do, and this is what I believe is going to be right for, uh, for the country. I go and say, so what can I do for you? And I said, you've been into Downing Street, you know the Prime Minister, can you not get me some, you know, some sort of viewing to him? Now this, is, this happened around about October 2011, okay? By April 2012, I was connected to go to Downing Street. So six months of networking, giving a little bit of help, support, driving, and passing your vision, not giving up, just kept going and going and going. I got to Downing Street. I walk into Downing Street. I'm like, yes, I'm going to meet the Prime Minister. I'm greeted by this guy. And he goes, hi, I'm here to see you. And I said, no, I'm here to see the Prime Minister. And he goes, no, you're seeing me. And I said, no, I'm here to see the Prime Minister. And he goes, you're seeing me. I said, no, I'm here to see Prime Minister. He goes, we can do this all day. He goes, but you've only got an hour. And I said, okay, I'll see you. So we went up, we sat in the small state dining room. Um, we sat down and he goes, do you know what? He goes, if you're in this room having dinner with the Prime Minister, you really made it. I said, is the Prime Minister here? And he said, yes. And I go, can I see him? He goes, no. And I'm like, oh, you've got to keep trying, right? You've got to keep trying. Um, anyway, I had an hour. So I started to pass this vision to him. And I was getting this. Any of you done this and seen this? You know, any of you got that little dog thing in the car? <laughs> to just go dang, dang. Maybe you got the Elvis one that goes like that, basically. <laughs> but anyway, uh, all I could see is him doing this. And I don't know if he was listening to me or listening to Beyonce. I just didn't know what was going down. <laughs> but anyway, I got to the end of the hour. And do you know what happened? He goes, thanks a lot for coming and seeing me. He's a great idea. Send me some information and we'll get back to you. What does that mean? Ha! <laughs> 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 uh, I think different. Remember I told you about passion and anger? Well, passion left the stairs and the Incredible Hulk came out, basically. I got to say, do you understand what you're trying to say here? Can we go another six months? Do you want more people to die? Does the Prime Minister want to lose the votes? Blah, 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 blah. I was just going all the way. He was just overwhelmed. I got to the stage where he just escorted me to the door and he goes, thank you very much for coming. There's nothing else I can do. At which point I decided to get a picture taken with the famous door. But it was raining, not as hard as Guatemala, but it was raining. And there was the police officer there and I said, can you take a picture of me? We didn't do selfies back then because we didn't have that capacity on our cameras. Anyway, um, just as about as he's about to take the picture, the door opens. And the guy turns around and goes, I've been thinking about what you said. He goes, the Prime Minister's hosting a reception tonight at 6 o'clock. It's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Why don't you come back? I said, okay, why not? I go, will I get to see the Prime Minister? He goes, yes. I'm like, 
double fist pump. Anyway, I walk out of Downing Street, I turn left, and instead of walking into a coffee shop and being a good citizen, uh, while I have a, a coffee, unfortunately it wasn't Guatemalan, it was probably some other <laughs> rank brand somewhere along the line, I walked into a bar and I got on the cervezas. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a bad man. I'm gonna see the Prime Minister. Facebook, 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 woof. Facebook, Facebook, woof. Facebook, Facebook, woof. Two hours, no food, five pints. I smell like I just come out of the Gale factory. Oh, the Gale factory is just giving me this free, I, I just stank of booze. I walked out, it's raining heavier than it was having got an umbrella. I'm now looking like a drunken rat walking back to Downing Street at six o'clock. Okay, get through security, get up through the door, into this room, Facebook, McDonald's, Home Retail Group, all the biggest corporations, Shell, everyone's there. I'm like, what the hell am I doing here? Pick up the first possible thing, it wasn't a water, it was a wine. Woof. Prime Minister comes, oh my God, I can see him. Woof. By the time he got up and did his speech, I'd had four glasses of wine on top of the five pints of beer. Okay, then he decides to get off the stage. He gets off the stage and I'm like, oh my God, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Oh, oh, come on, come on, quick, he's coming. And by the time I went to reach for the next glass, he's there in front of me. He goes, hi, I'm David Cameron. What do you think I did? No, I didn't puke on him, don't, don't think. <laughs> I took his hand and I started shaking it. I'm going, yeah, I know who you are. And he goes, so what do you do? I'm like, how long have you got? Have you ever been in that position? Ever been in a position you worked really hard to be somewhere or with someone or get to a point and when you get there you fluff your whole lines? Ever been there? Well I was there. I was so there. Okay and I'm like kicking there saying what the hell are you doing Ken? Come on I'm, a, I'm, a comp I'm not saying that I'm just like uh, I'm stuck like this. I'm still shaking his hand. It's like two minutes of shaking the man's hand. He goes can I have my hand back now? <laughs> Anyway, he turns around and he goes, look, thank you very much for coming to the reception. I really enjoy this. I need to see some other, some other people enjoy uh, the, you know, the, the rest of the reception. At which point he turns away. What do you think I did? I grabbed his arm. And as I grabbed his arm, I said, oh, I'm not going to say it for the camera, but oh, bad word. <laughs> They'll never let Indians back into Downing Street. What have I done? In his own backyard, I've grabbed the Prime Minister of our country. I've fiddled, fiddled him around, but I did say to him, in 45 seconds, after kind of readjusting myself, right, we know what the problem is. We've got a million young unemployed people. They, they're fear for their opportunities, and as a result of that, this is what they're doing. I've got a solution that I want to put forward, which is where we put industry and sector together alongside with young people and see, so they can both see their opportunities and, and, their, uh, and, and their abilities. My problem, Mr. Prime Minister, is no one knows who I am, so they don't take me seriously. I don't want money from you. All I want is a letter supporting me so I can do this event. And he goes, okay. I said, is it that easy? 45 seconds later, I was partying on with the more wine, man. <laughs> That was in April 2012, okay? May, June, July. I'm like these bloody politicians, all talk, no action. I was with a client, my phone rings. It's my wife. Wife never rings me at lunchtime. <laughs> yes, dear? You got mail. Yes, thank you, I know, I get it every day. No, you got mail. I'm like, what is it? You got mail. Can you, what is it? Is it an eviction notice? Have I, have I forgot to pay a bill? It's from Downing Street. Oh, oh, bloody open it. She opened it and there was a handwritten hand letter from David Cameron, signed Dave, supporting my event. In 2012, I created Youth Enterprise Live. It impacted 18,500 young people. We gave away three quarters of a million pounds in funding to help start, young people start up their businesses. 150,000 pounds of social enterprise funding, 3,000 apprenticeships and 300 jobs in two days. And we delivered this project between three people in six months. So from July right the way through to October, we got this done. I want to tell you today that you can have a ridiculous idea, you can think that it's poor, you can have people close doors on you, but at the end of the day, 
To scale something up, you need to keep progressing at it. You've got to know that there is a system, that there is a model, and that, that where you can grow. And why am I sharing this part of this, this story here with the scalability? Is you just don't know where it takes you. A week after doing this event, I was summoned back to Downing Street, and I thought, oh my God, this is where I'm going to get arrested for handling him. Sat down, and he said to me, this is the Prime Minister, he goes, you're quite a disruptor, aren't you? Hey, like that name, you are a disruptor. If you look at my business card, I'm CEO and Chief Disruptor. <laughs> and that's it, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for this whole moment to arrive where he's going to say, but we're going to have to arrest you for handling me. And he goes, would you like to become a special advisor to youth policy here in the UK? I'm like, eh? Me? He goes, yeah. He goes, I think you're just the right fit. He goes, we can't pay you. He goes, but would you like the, would like the honor? That one move scaled me as an individual and a brand right over the world. It's because I've been a special advisor to the Prime Minister that the UK ambassador to Guatemala actually invited me over to Guatemala. It took me in places that I cannot fathom. So I want you to learn from the fact that you can be, whatever you do, do something that has scalability built into it, but understand that you could be launched into something completely indifferent. My whole career has changed since 2012. You know, as much as I do in business, I spend more time on the stage trying to, trying to tell stories and inspire people. And that's really what I've always wanted to do. I'm actually living my dream now. But it starts, your scalability can start from anywhere and it can launch you from you. So don't always be brave, be bold and push, uh, push out because you just don't know where it's going to take you. So being great, there's me. I was a bit fatter back then. Downing Street, here's the letter. Well, that's the letter with the, uh, with the Prime Minister. I don't know if any of you recognize that room, but that's an auditorium from here in UFM during MIT. That's your stage in uh, your conference room. I've worked with royal royalty. This is a guy who six years ago lost his job. Didn't know really what he's going to do. Didn't tell his wife. Just kind of stumble along. But whatever you do, do it with pride, do it with passion, and do it with anger. But when you do it like that, that's where the greatness comes out of it. Whatever you do, leave legacy. Be remembered. Give value. Because in my line of work now, it's all about value. I'm part of a 20 select entrepreneur group for the UK, which does an entrepreneurial summit to look at where we're going to address the issues of entrepreneurship and employability. MIT have given me opportunity to become a, 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 an advisor on the GSW stuff. I've never, I didn't even finish university. I'm on the advisory board for King's College London. I'm on the advisory board for the British Council's Entrepreneurship Africa project. How the hell do you get on these things? I don't even know. It's coming by invitation. Why? Because I'm always focused on my passion and my anger, and I let my passion rule my heart, but I let my head be focused through anger. Whatever I'm doing, I'm doing because I'm pissed off that it's not there already, and that I have to, I have to go out there and do this. I have to make that change. For me, value isn't about the number of digits I have in my bank balance, but more the number of digits that I can engage with throughout any, any one year. So in 2013, after my first world travel, uh, world tour, I contracted malaria and almost died. Okay? My wife wouldn't let me out, there, out of the country for almost one and a half years. It was like literally I had a padlock put in and it was just cuffed here to this day. Six months ago, at the back end of uh, 2015, I decided this is enough. I really want to get out there. I want to get out there and I want to make waves again. And through my heart, I decided that I wanted to get back out and do a disruptive talks tour. And this is where I wanted to go in my bucket list to three places in the world that I've never been. And I wanted to make sure that by the end of the year, I've actually circumnavigated the whole globe and spoken to at least 100,000 people. Okay? It was in my heart. It was in my heart, and that's what I followed. On the first half of this year, I came over to Guatemala in June. Um, and then I was in Brazil in July as well. These are, Brazil is a place I've never been for in my life. 52,000 miles, 42 cities, four continents. 
and almost 80,000 people had been in engaged with, and I haven't finished the year yet. Don't tell me it's not possible. Don't tell me I can't, because in life, if you want to be great, you've got to, you have choices. You always have a choice. It's not about the choice you make, it's the decision that you take. That's what makes you great. Make a choice, yes, that's great, but take a decision. Act upon it. I don't want to hear that I didn't have a choice, because you do have a choice. It's the decision that you're making. Most people fear taking that decision because they think they're going to lose something. If you keep looking behind you, you're never going to see what's in front of you. And life isn't about the destination that you get to, but it's the small journeys that you take and the people that you meet and the creation of what you make. So for me, I want you to answer, you know, I want you to ask yourself questions. What is it that I be totally believe in, that I'm totally passionate about? What is it that makes me angry? What is it that I can do to impact and influence that? What is the value that I can give? And more importantly, it's a situation of how do I keep moving forward? Because if you want to be different, if you want to be scalable, and if you want to be great, you have to keep moving forward. There's no point working backwards. The world doesn't work backwards. The time doesn't go backwards. So why would you walk, think backwards? So today I've started and scaled and sold two businesses. I've impacted over half a million people around the world. I sit on the advisory board of about 12 companies. I've mentored over 600, supported 3,200 3, um, different businesses on startup, helped on investments, been an advisor to the prime minister, sitting on different advisory board. Don't know how the hell I got on there, but I'm there. But that just validates to me that I'm doing something right. I'm doing something right. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of um, some quotes of my, you know, throughout my life. I think some of the morals of being different, being scalable, being great is, does resonate with this first quote here, which is the distance between your dreams and reality is what we call action. A lot of you will, will get, can be inspired by my story. A lot of you may feel like you can go and do something, you want to do something about this, which is great. I love that. You know, if I can give you some sort of spirit to move forward, that's brilliant. The difference here is most of you will dream about it. Most of you keep talking about it, but you won't do anything about it. Or you believe, I can't do anything. Remember, life has choices. You always have choices. You've always got decisions. You're only six degrees away from anyone that you want to be with. So the distance between your dream and your action uh, so, uh, and realities is what we call action. This one's quite uh, personal to me. There's never going to be uh, one answer to any one question. And the reason I tell you this is when I was young, I was told uh, by my math teacher that I'm no good at maths and I'll never amount to anything because of maths. Never used, um, used that as motivation, but I was kind of confused because I used to get the answer right, but I did it faster than the other students. You know what the problem was? I didn't conform. I didn't conform to the process, that they, the methodology that they wanted me to do. So he would fail me on the fact that I didn't follow their path. And in life, there's never going to be one answer to any one question. It's the, it's the answer you want to create it to be. You, we can all take different routes to get to the same destination. Why should we conform and make that uniform? So if you see someone doing something in a particular way, it doesn't mean you have to follow it. You can innovate your own way. It's important in the difference of being scalable, being different and being great, is you make your rules, but you've got to then abide by them. Your mistakes make you who you are. You learn and grow with every choice that you make. Come on. What does the word failure mean? Does anyone want to tell me? What does the word failure mean? Do you think it's the opposite of success? Failure is not the opposite of success, yeah. Absolutely, there is an opportunity to learn. Okay, let me give you a quick 101 on failure. Failure doesn't exist in my vocabulary. I don't believe in failure, and I'm going to sound really arrogant when I say this, but I will never fail. I can only learn, okay? This hand represents expectation. This hand represents delivery. The gap between your expectation and your delivery is failure. 
the gap between the expectation, what do you expect it to look like, and what you deliver is what we call failure. It's giving you an opportunity to reiterate. Was my expectation too high? Or was I just damn too lazy and didn't put my enough effort into it? Do I, have, do I not have the right resources? Failure is something which, which people, people can live and, you know, they die by it within their businesses. It can be really painful. It can be a real cause and effect to actually put people off. It's a learning point. It's all it is, a learning point. I want you, if there's any one thing that I can request you to do is take that word out of your vocabulary forever. Replace it with learn, replace it with experience, and replace it with opportunity. So every time you feel that you've not got something that you are expecting, there is an opportunity to change that. Always an opportunity to change that. And believe me, you will learn a lot more from that than you would learn in any other book because it's life, it's yours, it's personal. And success is another thing on the flip side of this. It's a perception that society bestows upon us. But success is your own thing, so never compare it to anyone else's. It's yours, it belongs to you. The minute you compare your success to anyone else, you start living theirs. Don't live their, their success, live your own. I live my own success. I'm happy, I don't need to have all the money in the world. I don't have to be a billionaire. I'm living what I want to do. I'm learning from what I want, you know, from all of this. And it helps me to keep growing. It took six years for my parents to really understand what I do, but when they saw it, it was amazing. I think my wife still to this day doesn't really know what I do. She just thinks, my kids think I actually just go on holiday. That's, that's all they think I do. Okay, don't chase people, be an example. Um, you know, attract them. The bit here I want to talk about is people will come and go in your life, okay? Those that are supposed to be there, they'll be there, they'll stay, and they'll remain always. Those that come and go, it's just a natural part of life. You know what? Sometimes you've had a, a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend, and it hasn't worked out, they go. You know, you, you, some people mull over it for the, you know, for the next couple of, or cry or whatever it is for a couple of months, and then all of a sudden they meet someone else. It happens. The same happens in business. Sometimes you start with particular co-founders, but the relationship goes sour. It's a part and process. When I started Enterprise Lab, there were three of us. Now there's only me on the top helm of that business. It's just a natural order. But whatever you do, don't chase people. Do what you do and make enough noise that they can hear it, that they come to you, that they become magnetized towards you you'll get much more out of the people that you admire and follow if they come to you than if you chase them. We talk about the traits of successful people. There is a mental resolve um, of keep going. Just keep going. Part and parcel of the success of Youth Enterprise Live and what it brought to me in launching uh, my career was great. The failure point of this was that the business suffered and failed, and I lost a quarter of a million pounds in that business. I'm not saying you need grit and mentality to keep moving forward. You just gotta understand that loss is a part of gain as much as failure is a part of success. At the end of the day, if you do uh, give in at that moment in loss, you've just give up all the work that you've, you've actually put. What was worth doing it in the first place? I want you to remember, whatever you can lose, you can always regain back. The only thing you can't is time, your health to a certain extent, and your spirit. Because once you fix yourself into something where I can't, I can't, I can't, it's really hard to turn it around to I can, I can, I can. The only thing you have to do is keep practicing. Keep practicing. Collaborate, share your ideas, build, and pass your visions. But whatever you do, do it from the heart not from the head. So, I've always talked about the fact that attitudes and behaviors reflect in your actions and your outcomes. You wanna change your results, you want a better life, you want richness, whatever it is that you want out there, and you're not getting it. To change your results, you have to change your actions. To change your actions, you have to change your attitude. To change your attitude, you have to change your behavior. 
And to change your behavior, you have to change the way you see something. So a 1% change in your attitude, I can guarantee you will give you a 100% change in your results. And that, my friends, is the secret of how to be different, be scalable, and be great. Thank you very much.